Okay, great. You know, Marcos, thank you so much for bringing up this idea of the of the um, the way that we are feeling, because in a way it relates to it relates to um, the environment. And, you know, the fact that we have had this sort of uh, situation happen over and over again because of the fact that you know we have progressed as humans in a way that. We are no longer just using natural elements or natural habitats, but that we have become this world of brick and mortar and, and cement and glass and plastic. And all of these different aspects really lead to, uh, unfortunately, the way it has to be said is to a certain demise, you know, and, and, and that's why it's important to have platforms like this. Um, so it couldn't have been at a better time for you to bring this. I, I really appreciate that. Um, everyone, I just want to say thank you so much again for, for, um, for being supportive of this platform. The Summer Art Series uh, 2020 is a response from many students uh, and many historians and many uh, art, art artists who are part of the Cal State LA uh, College of Art. And we are uh, continuing the mission of our department, which is to be informative, to be informed, to provide, to seek truth, and share that knowledge with others. So I, on behalf of uh, my fellow peers, I do thank you. Um, we, did, we had an amazing turnout last week. And uh, it looks you know, uh, like we're going to be doing that a, a, again as well. Um, I want to say uh, that you know that you are uh, you are in for a great great uh, lecture. Um, I'm excited about it. I've been excited. I couldn't even wait until it was presented. I was just excited about it from the beginning. So let me go ahead and start off by introducing um, um, our incredible lecturer today, uh, Miss. Uh, Gabriela Dillard is currently an art, well, she's an art historian at Cal State LA. Uh, she is a transfer student from Pasadena City College where she earned four associate degrees. Um, a native of Rosario, Argentina, she moved, uh, immigrated to the United States in 1990, uh, pursuing um, dreams with, along with her parents and her family, you know, that American dream. So she settled in uh, El Monte, California, where her parents set an example of hard work and encouraged the pursuit of higher education. Uh, two values that have helped her uh, continue her pursuit of her bachelor's uh, is uh, through an academic career that has been spanning now for 20 years. Um, at the completion of her bachelor's degree, um, she uh, want, aspires to work as a, in art conservation as an art history educator. Uh, she enjoys painting, spending time with her husband, John of 14 years and her two children, Olivia and Jonathan. So let's give a big round of uh, warm applause to Ms. Gabby. Yay. Thank you everyone. Oh, Thank you. Goodness. So Gabby, before you get started on your amazing lecture, um, one question that I have for you just to start setting you into the program, into your lecture is, what uh, so what interested you in in doing research about sustainability and and those practices during the like the Aztec Mexica times? Um, well, you know, going to Cal State LA, you take um, well, I had the opportunity to take a lot of classes um, when it came to the topic of Mesoamerica, and um, you know, a lot of First of all, there's not a lot of uh, information out there, I think, uh, in, into the general public. Um, but once you start learning about these civilizations and, and some of the, the, the technology that they used and some of the technology that not only they used, but they implemented and helped them grow and sustain their civil, uh, civilizations for, you know, 200, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years, you know that you, you can see the value in it and you can see the value uh when it comes to you know when you when you look around us like modern times you see so many climate problems that they didn't have um back then and that if we just implemented some of those techniques some of those practices and even if we just respected the earth like they did 
um, we would solve a lot of our, our climate uh, problems and, and some of that, that crisis that's happening right now. So um, it's just, I made the connection of, you know, looking around today into the solutions of yesterday. And I, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear to me that, um, that these things are not only important to know, but to, to teach, to make the public aware of. Rightly so, rightly so. One of the, uh, you know, major developments in terms of how we work with sustainability now is that there is a lot of reference to older methods as opposed to not just discovering new ways of doing things, but now that there's sort of this sort of holistic, you know, I, I guess uh, for the black, better lack of a word, a throwback, a holistic throwback <laughs> where people are, you know, saying let's pursue medicinal, uh, you know, things the way that they used to do them, you know, where it was about herbs, natural herbs and things like that. And I think that's, uh, that works into the same idea that we don't need to make these chemicals. We don't need to create new things that could destroy the earth potentially, but that rather we want to go back to a moment of environmental sustainability that really did a lot of work and that did a lot of um, proper do proper respect to the planet, no? Um, yeah. So why don't we go ahead and uh, let you take the floor and, and do your thing. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, everybody can see it. But please let me know if you can't or if there's any problems seeing. Let me see. Um, should I go full screen or um, is everyone okay with that view? I think we're, that seems good. Yeah. Okay. So um, as you can see, me, uh, my title is uh, ASIC Sustainable uh, Practices. Yeah, you know uh, what? You can go full screen. You can go full screen. Okay. A little bit better? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, like, like we were talking just a minute ago, um, it's this topic is very interesting and uh, there's a, a few things that I made connections with when it comes to living in California and LA that I see as problems, uh, climate problems today that we can um, implement some of these uh, specifically Aztec technologies and practices. So um, modern society is always looking forward in time to find the best, uh, most advanced technology to solve problems. Um, the same technology that keeps our lives comfortable and pushes us to live without making almost no effort um, is often the same that depletes our natural resources. Um, Here's some of the, uh, I have divided the, the issues and the solutions so you can kind of see what the, um, uh, what this this uh, presentation will be following. Um, water consumption and contamination along with the disposal of waste and the concern over yield of, uh, of crops to feed our ever-growing world population are leading topics of global concerns. Uh, solutions to these problems often fall back onto quick fixes. Uh, though often uh, thought of as a society where the focus was mainly on war and sacrifice, the ASIC civilization has a lot more to offer, especially when it comes to long-term sustainability. Um, it was one of the most successful societies in, in history when it came to the development of systems that, that would solve problems centered around water resources. Uh, ASICs also refined a number of technologies that produce little to zero waste, uh, which helped the civilization flourish into one that could support thousands of people living in the capital city of Tenochtitlan and millions more living throughout the Aztec um, empire. Um, this uh, picture was was very was one of the one of the ones that I saw that really grabbed my attention. This is actually, uh, you're looking at part of LA and what the river would look like when it used to flood. Um, so I wanted to discuss um, the water supply problems using the city of LA as an example. Um, so the city was founded along the flowing banks of the LA River, which had a recurrent flooding problem that was uh, quote unquote solved by cementing uh, the river. Um, this attempt at controlling the LA River eventually brought on unintended consequences uh, such as drought. The city of LA looked into the neighboring communities of the San Fernando Valley 
which at the time were farming communities. Um, and they looked for their water supply and through what some would call questionable means, uh, they secured their, their water source. Um, the, this nearsighted method of securing the supply of water to LA, along with the largely unrestricted use of water by the, the city, um, not only caused the, the farming communities of the San Fernando Valley, Valley to disappear, because if you go to the San Fernando Valley today, I don't think you see probably any farms. Um, it also spread the city's waters, uh, sources of water to uh, eventually include uh, Northern California, the state of Colorado, and the Salton Sea, among other sources. Um, and in the Salton Sea, it's currently devastating uh, the lake bed community and its ecosystem. Um, the Salton Sea used to be a lakeside um, kind of retreat where people would go and actually swim and boat and stuff like that. And this is one of the pictures that I found where you can see the water receding so quickly and so much that the ecosystem um, is being largely affected. So the Aztec civilization had um, similar water supply problems um, like, like we do here in LA, um, built uh, on an island in the middle of the shallow lake of uh, Tezcoco. So that's the island, that's the, the main city. Um, Tenochtitlan, uh, the, the Aztec capital, had a limited supply of potable water, which was carefully planned and, and used. Uh, lake Texcoco was part of a five lake system in the Valley of Mexico that included Lake Chalco and Lake Xochimilco, where, uh, which were natural sources of fresh, fresh water, while the Lake Texcoco had undrinkable brackish water that um, ended up posing some problems. Uh, the first issue was that of separating the fresh water and the salty water surrounding Tenochtitlan, which was solved by building a collection of dams that would not only keep both types of water from mixing, but also allowed the control of the flow of water surrounding the, the city or the island. And also, uh, one of the things it did, it, it maintained the water levels needed for successful harvest. Um, According to Steve uh, Mythen, uh, as written in, in the Domestication of Water, Water Management in the Ancient World and its Prehistoric Origins, the city was um, interlaced with canals uh, connected by, to the mainland by a causeway which had a 16 kilometer levee designed to keep uh, spring fed fresh water in the vicinity of the city separate from the brackish waters of the lake. Um, as you can see, uh, some of those, they look like roads. Those are the, some of the causeways. Not only did they con it connect the main island to the, I would say, the mainland, um, but it, some of those also helped uh, when it came to the, the water supply. Um, the, at first, the, the causeways were built and allowed the fresh water to be brought into the, the island on foot and then on, later on, on uh, canoes. But as the city grew, so did the need of a constant flow of drinkable water. Enter Chapultepec Aqueduct. Um, the Chapultepec Aqueduct system was made of two adjoining pipelines, as you see in the picture, um, that allowed uninterrupted water flow when repairs were needed. So they would, uh, let's say the right side was broken, they would allow the left side, they would, they would uh, stop the right side from flowing and the left side would still keep going and keep the flow of water um, uninterruptedly. Um, the water system worked so well that once the structure of dam canals and aqueducts were in place, there was also no need to constantly seek out uh, fresh water sources. Um, though dry spells period still existed, the system worked well enough to keep prime agricultural conditions to support population growth even after the fall of Tenochtitlan. Um, when they were rebuilt into their final colonial form. So what happened um, after the Spaniards took over the city, they, um, they, they broke a lot of this, this system and rebuilt it um, using a colonial style. And those are the ruins that you see here uh, in Mexico City. Uh, they don't uh, transport water anymore, but the, 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 uh, the structures are still there. Um, and I think in this picture, you can actually see the, the two uh, different uh, canals. Okay. So the next um, issue I wanted to talk 
about was the uh, food supply. Um, this picture is actually taken in the Central Valley of California. And as you can see, the, water, the plants or the, the agriculture grows wherever the water is. Um, and there, there's constant uh, problems with water supply. And I don't know if, if you've ever driven up to, the, to Northern California on the side of the roads, you see those signs that say drought, you know, or uh, there's no water or, you know, all these things concerning the, the supply. So in an attempt to reduce global food insecurity and lower uh, production costs and, and uh, increase crop yields and therefore profits, we currently use uh, GMOs or genetically uh, modified organisms in harvesting as well as fertilizers, pesticides, and um, monoculture crops um, such, such as corn and, and soy. Monoculture meaning that we don't grow a bunch of different types of corn. We don't grow a bunch of different types of crops. We basically narrow it down to a few. And uh, uh, for a long time, it was corn. And now we see soy popping up uh, worldwide. Um, these modern techniques have consequences that include drought, the pollution of waterways, and the degradation of land, which lead to the decline in crop yields over time. Um, so this is the case uh, here in Cal the, the Central Valley of California. Though made up of fertile land, it's also a place where water disputes are a constant concern. According to the, the Department of uh, the California Department of Water Sources, agriculture accounts for approximately 80% of all the water used in California. Uh, years of growing unsustainable crops like almonds, cotton, and rice, uh, use a high, which use a high volume of water, along with California's water scarcity, um, agriculture suffers. Just like modern day California though, uh, the Valley of Mexico had limited, uh, a limited supply of water to be used in agriculture. Enter uh, uh, Chinampas. Um, early on, on in their history, the Aztecs adopted a system of Chinampas for the purpose of growing staple foods. This advanced and sustainable agricultural system was made by digging drainage canals into the swampy lake bottom and then piling up layers of mud and floating aquatic um, plants to form narrow islands and peninsulas. These si the sides of a chinampa were held in place with posts that had uh, vines and branches interwoven between them. Willow trees were also planted along the edge of the pot, which would hold the, um, these little islands together and, and would prevent them from eroding away. Um, most chinampas were about 300 feet long and 15 to 30 feet wide. Uh, the crop yields were an essential component of the population growth of Tenochtitlan. It is estimated that it's, um, that its height, the city was home to 250,000 people. Um, so you can see that, that this system not only uh, worked, uh, but it was, it was highly sustainable. Uh, with, the, with maize being the main food staple of the Aztec, um, it is estimated that after the consumption of needs, both dietary and non-dietary, of 30,000 lake bed uh, residents were met um, an annual of 10 million kilograms of maize, um, equivalent uh, of agricultural sur surplus, so surplus, so extra, um, or enough to feed 50,000 people per year, reached the storehouses and the markets of Platelolco uh, Tenochtitlan, which you see on the, the bottom right hand side. And though um, maize was a primary source of nutrition for the Aztec, they also grew a number of different crops, including, but not limited to, beans, squash, chili peppers, and various plants and herbs used for natural medicines. Uh, some crops were grown complementary to one another, such as maize, beans, and squash, which were grown with the bean stalks wrapped around the maize stalks and the squash at the foot of the two other plants, maximizing the sources of, um, of food growth. So up on the right, top right, uh, that's a little drawn, a little example that I found where you could kind of see where, how they would grow it. And it, um, it's actually called a, the three sisters or the three sister system where they not only, um, they maximize resources, but they work together when it comes to even um, having um, insects not eat them. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it works. That's probably a, another topic that is that I'll probably look into and end up writing a paper on because it's 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 yeah. Um, so 
waste management. So this picture was taken, um, is from the Pune Hills um, landfill, or what used to be the Pune Hills uh, landfill. Um, and it shows, you know, how much trash we were throwing up there uh, for, for many years. Um, so we really don't bother ourselves when it comes to waste. Um, we, you know, throw the trash in the trash bin and then we take it out to a front, the front of our house or, or we flush it down the toilet and then local waste management collects or, and disposes or recycles some of, of the waste we produce. But we normally don't see what happens to our trash once we, you know, let go of it. Um, so for many years in LA County, some of our waste was recycled and some was burned into energy like steam, but the majority was buried on top of this hill um, in nearby uh, the city of, of Pena Hills. Uh, for more than 50 years uh, in operation, the landfill grew higher than 500 feet. Um, just a little anecdote, I remember, uh, you know, like, like uh, Gabriel said, I came here in 1990 and I remember that hill not being as big as when, when it closed. It was significantly big, significantly uh, taller. Um, but once it closed in 2013, uh, LA County Sanitation solved the, the problem of, of, uh, of now not having a landfill with a modern solution. It basically went and created an even larger landfill out of uh, the California desert. So again, it was one of those, well, what are we going to do? Oh, let's just, you know, get something bigger. Yeah. You know? um, but unlike today, the Aztec treatment of waste was sustainable. Um, as of yet, there are no descriptions or records that I have seen or read of Aztec landfills or dumps. Um, the Aztec dealt with uh, Tenochtitlan's waste by converting it into resor resourceful products that would help the empire thrive. Waste was provided uh, from various sources throughout the city. Since the Aztec did not have large um, farm animals, manure was produced largely by collected human uh, fecal matter. Um, farmers kept dumpas uh, fertile by the practice, practice of mucking and manuring. Chinampa farmers manure their pots with compost that consisted with vegetation that floated in the canals and, um, and human manure. Chinampas were also used to raise fish uh, for consumption. Nope. Did I go away? Am I still here? You're there fine. You Okay, because they said I was muted. I no, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the canals that ran along the Chinampas were also used to raise fish for consumption. The canals would uh, be uh, swept periodically for cleaning, which added the nutrient-rich uh, fish uh, excrement as another component in the manure. Uh, besides agricultural use, human waste was also um, a source for dyeing fabrics and making medicines. Uh, without a doubt, urine was the product of, of the human body most used, and it was utilized to treat things like the sternum, dandruff, boils on the head, ringworm of the scalp, abscesses, wounds, ear infections, chapped faces, neck infections, and even tartar on the teeth, as well as, as um, an attempt at, um, at healing internal contusions, which required the medicine to be drunk. Um, any items that were suitable to be disposed of by burning like textiles were um, collected and burned at night to help illuminate public spaces. So not only were they using, you know, things that we would never, you know, today that we would never think of using, they were using in a way that would help the general public. Everybody had a clay pot in their house that they would collect their waste, the, the human waste and either sell it or use it themselves to, um, to basically live 100% sustainable. Um, so, let me see. In conclusion, the adoption of ASIC sustainability practices uh, hold the key in helping today's global climate crisis. Uh, the current problems of water use and contamination, food insecurity and waste management could see huge improvements by the adoption of just one of the Aztecs technologies and practices, which in my opinion should be the Chinampa system. Uh, nevertheless, it's critical that we change the current approach 
uh, to urgent environmental problems by seeing the continuous failure of modern quick fixes and instead adopting the Aztecs practice of sustainability as the solution um, so we can ensure humanity's survival. Thank you. Yeah. Yay. Awesome. Bravo. Thank you. That was wonderful. Fantastic. That was really good. Good information. <laughs> Let me see. Let's stop the sharing. There you go. So great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was literally like I was literally at the edge of my seat the entire time. Yeah. This is such great information you're giving us. And like towards the end, like how they use urine. That's something mm -hmm. like so many people are so disgusted by, but there's so many healing properties to it. That's amazing. That was so great, Gabby. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. That was thank incredibly you, cohesive. Absolutely fantastic. I don't think anyone has ever done that before. Just put that together <laughs> well, and just have you, it presented so like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank Gabby, so much. I, I want to say, uh, I, before I, I, anybody else gives you their, uh, their feedback, um, I just want to say thank you for, for providing us with a different perspective. I took class with you, and I had not even thought about this at all. We went, we studied this, mm -hmm. and we got through some things, but you really went into depth in terms of describing, you know, the, the medicinal uses of, uh, you know, uh, of the things that, you know, the Aztecs use. Uh, not, all, not only that, but also, you know, being so direct with the regards to like the architecture created for sustainability, you know, like the Chapultepec aqueducts. Um, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of that. So I think that that was really, uh, it was very complimentary to your entire argument. And I think that right now, that argument that you're making really stands very tall. And it's something that really needs to be um, expressed a lot more. So thank you for opening that door for a lot of us. I, I would say you've definitely made me grow. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you so much. Do you have any uh, comments or questions from anybody in the audience? I love the parallels between how you, between, you know, the situations in Tenochtitlan and California. Like, I think people sometimes for, you know, you know, forget that, uh, that like the climates can be really similar and some of their problems are also some of the problems that we've been having. And also just like within like the history of California, like, and the history of water in California and the history of water in Mexico is so fascinating. Like, and the fact that you touched on, on those two things and saw the parallels, it's, it was just really, like, really amazing. It's just when those two things just line up, it's like amazing, amazing. Yeah, I, 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 wanna, I wanted to make sure that, um, to point out that, you know, for for a lot of the people that are into Mesoamerican studies, we're well aware of the um, idea of Aztlan and being an island and then coming back to Tenochtitlan as being an island. But the one commonality that they share with that is water, you know, and, and considering that Tlaloc is one of the main gods of, of, uh, of uh, the, the Aztec Empire and the Mexica uh, culture. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, to put it in that perspective for you to say, look, this is, you know, we can learn from what they were doing because it's still prevalent in our time, you know? So I think that that's really great. Um, are there any other, any, anybody else have comments uh, or questions about uh, for her before I get to mine? I would like to say something. Yes. I really wanted to say a fantastic connection again uh, with the two similar ecosystems and deserts. You know, I, I completely understand why after all this time, it's so important to look back at the existing systems that are, that we have and realize what was done to them. And it was an excellent timeline where you connected the past and showed its present and then even showed that what the future could be. And I really loved how you showed uh, <laughs> Los Angeles with the, the LA river there. I know all that concrete is now there because, that was the best solution at the time. And it's one of those things where 
you know, looking at it now, we could have done so many different things. We could have had that farmland still there. We could have had a lot better, a um, lot better ways to give actual local foods and support local farming into the city. And, you know, we wasted that opportunity, but we saved those people from, <laughs> from all those floods and all those I, essentially like t heavy typhoons that would come into LA. But you know, this is exactly what we need to keep thinking about the future in the way by reflecting on the past. You did an excellent job. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, and to not to not- But I, I, I definitely agree. Yeah, I, you Go know, I, it makes me think about uh, in a way also the way you described the, uh, the, the repurposing of bodily fluids and, and bodily functions with regards to how the, you know, the Aztec Empire, the Mexicas, were well known to have had a lot of um, usage of uh, what you would call original or original med medicine, medicinal, you know, I mean, I think uh, you, the, the, my internet connection is unstable. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So I'm thinking about, you know, one thing I was thinking about was like, you know, the, the book written, uh, you know, the, it's the Libellus, the Medicinibulus, uh, that was written by Juan Badiano, and it was translated in Nahuatl, I think this is 1522, or uh, 1552, excuse me, and this was written at the Santa Cruz de Tlatelolco uh, College, and it was one of those, one of, part of like the Florentine Codex, where it was, you know, this book that just describe every single process of all the medicine so I can see where that would have been also part of the the way that they used you know the the, the things you discussed because it, it is true you know um, and, and to think that you know we have to take into consideration when you showed the map of Tenochtitlan and you showed the the little island I mean that's 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 no bigger than downtown LA right now right and and to think that, that that had, you know, a population of, what, 250,000, that was the, the estimate, you know, mm -hmm. considering, again, that, that you're talking about a, a very, very, you know, the, 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 the reason and need for water was so important because, you know, the Aztecs were very hygienic in terms of, you know, taking care of their bodies, you know, there's this idea that they showered twice, at least twice a day, you know, where uh, as opposed to European um, nations where they might shower once a month. Um, so it really puts into consideration this idea that, you know, we have to think about ways to go back to our ancestors or our ancestry and, and, and look at into the sustainability factor because perhaps maybe we can avoid having, you know, something as hideous as that huge trash uh, ocean pool that's in the Pacific Ocean. I'm I'm not sure if you all know that, but there is a there's a I don't I I want to call it a blob because that's essentially what it is, <laughs> but it's the size yeah. of it's it's I believe it's the size of Texas. And it stretches from right off of California all the way closer to Hawaii. And that whole section is filled with, I want to remember, I want to say 18,000 tons of debris. It, it, and it just makes you think, you know, what can we do? What can be done? So I think that, um, you know, recommendations such as yourself, you know, to, to bring it into light really make... Um, a point and case for that, you know, to for us to go back to sustainability again. You know, what did what did you think about? My first question is actually with regards to the chinampas. Um, mm -hmm. What what was your original interest in that? Because I think that's a you know a lot of people forget that farming is such an important part of the Aztec, um, you know, infrastructure, you know, agriculture. So. How did you discover the Chinampas and why did you decide to write about that? Um, well, I remember my first, somebody mentioned it because there were, there were I guess they mentioned I, um, a way of growing with water. They had, I mean, I was a kid, I think. And somebody had mentioned it like almost in passing. And then um, as I went on into my education, little by little, I was gathering information. And um, 
it's just every time that I would, that this would come up, I would learn something different or something new. And it's just not only the, you know, more with this research, but even before then, it's just, it was, it was so smart. It was just so, so smart. And they were smart enough to see it, to see it as something that um, would support their, their, their people. Because I think a lot of people, like, is this, Chinampas had existed before the Aztecs did, before Tenochtitlan did. But to, for them to be smart enough to adopt and say, you know, let's do this and this is going to work here, even though we have salty water, even though the conditions aren't what they're supposed to be, let's, let's, let's do it and let's try it. And it worked. And we still have examples in, in Mexico that have been there since then. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And, and, um, yeah, it's just being smart about everything, about using anything that they, they could get their hands on and um, not letting anything go to waste. It was literally anything and everything that you could think of was used and reused and, um, and respected, respected as, uh, as a source, not as just, well, you know, I'm done with this and so I'm just going to throw it out. I mean, I thought it, the, the, even um, the lighting of the streets by, you know, being smart enough to, to burn their trash at night. I mean, it's like, who thinks of that? But, you know, right. they did. And it's just, once you, you start learning about it, you're, there's no way of, um, that you can deny that it's, it's not only interesting, but it's, it's one of the smartest things I've ever read um, any civilization, civilization doing. You know, it's really funny that you, well, not funny. I, I want to say it's uh, ac absolutely accurate that you mentioned that because that's actually still happening in, in, in some parts in Mexico uh, in order to avoid, you know, because you have to pay a service to get the trash collected, right? Mm -hmm. So some people who cannot afford will actually burn their, you know, their trash in, a, in their house. Uh, one of the processes I've actually seen um, is they dig a hole in the dirt and they throw the trash there and that's how they're able to, you know, contain it and not it be you know, spreading or anything, you know, that would endanger, um, you know, you're, according to Dr. Uh, to Prof Pro Professor Manuel Aguilar Moreno, you know, the, the Chinampas existed from the time of the Olmecs because they have found uh, examples of existing Chinampas, where I think that you're right that, you know, the fact that they were able to work on this and, and really make it uh, uh, work for them is because of the ingenuity, you know, of building all these different sections within Tenochtitlan to contain the salty water from mixing in with the with the fresh water, because otherwise they would have their crops would have died, you know. And it's it's what's really cool is is that you think about that, you know, in Veracruz, you wouldn't have, you know, if if the water's coming from a river, uh, then it's you know it's a lot more. To, for the lack of a better word, it's cleaner or it's more, uh, I guess, trusting. Whereas, uh, you know, the, the fact that you had the five inner lakes, the five lakes were inter interlocked. And the fact that, you know, Lake, uh, um, Lake Chalco and uh, Zumpanco were the higher lakes. So all the water would come down and eventually end up in, the, in Lago Texcoco, which is why the water was salty because all the, you know, the debris accumulated there, right? So it's really awesome to see that, that, they, that they had that ingenuity. I think that that's what you're referring to, you know, that the Aztecs were so ingenious in terms mm -hmm. of yes. figuring out how to transfer water, how to make it grow, how to keep it growing, how to recycle, mm -hmm. you know? We're talking about, you know, being zero waste, or is that the new term, right? The being zero... Yeah, like zero waste. Being yeah. zero waste. So it's nothing new, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people are doing it now, but they've been doing it for much longer than, than we've been around, for sure. Unfortunately, now it's something that's kind of a luxury, like the luxury mm -hmm. to compost things and to be zero waste and to mm -hmm. that lifestyle when it should be acceptable to everybody and have everyone be able to um, reduce as much as they can right right and yeah it's like it's like nowadays there's capitalism now has a relationship with with the concept of of, of sustainability mm -hmm. and i think you know yeah i mean 
I, you know, when talking about the history of, you know, like the history of, you know, like in Mexico and even in California, it's just when you, when you look back at all of these systems in which the indigenous peoples were able to, you know, efficiently utilize, you know, um, the, the land in such beautiful ways. And then you look at what, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism had wrought on the environment. It's, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing in, in the amount of devastation that yeah, those right. three things have, you know, are, and have become so interconnected in the ways we even so much as just approach things like trying to heal the land or, or, or sustainability. It's like you have to you know, almost try to, it seems like such a daunting task with those three things just kind of hovering. Um, you know, it's funny that you bring, bring that up about capitalism, because I was reading, um, I was, you know, clean up the, the presentation, clean up the information, and I was reading on how it was uh, looked down on for anybody, especially the wealthy class, to, um, to flaunt their wealth, meaning they, if you didn't need it, you weren't buying it you weren't buying extra of anything. And I think that um, that touches on what you were saying about capitalism and, and waste is that, you know, people today, it's acceptable if you have money to buy multiples of whatever, you know, houses, cars, even clothes and stuff like that. And so that contributes a lot to, to eventually to waste. Right. And, and, you know, I think that is also part of uh, this idea that you're also referring to, I think, when we talk about how uh, many cultures, many of the primordial cultures, you know, the, they related a lot to the, um, to the flora and fauna, to their diaspora, you know, where they reflected on what was around them and they had a sense of respect for their surroundings. You know, they weren't just going around chopping, you know, everything to bits only because they, they could build bigger, better palaces. Um, we just, uh, we just, uh, heard from uh, Ina um, in Mexico City that um, they literally found a, they just found the flooring on the palace of Vaxayacatl. Um, and, and they did this because they took, you know, maybe a couple of years to tr actually dig as a way to preserve, you know, uh, the building that's currently there, but then also as a way to understand how how the building processes were done, right? And the one thing that that's interesting is that um um oh my god I'm 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 forget I'm skipping his name, but he's right now the current director of Templo Mayor. He took over for for Matos Moctezuma. Uh, the this is uh, let me I can get the book, but uh, hold on one second. Sorry about that. I just Leonardo Lopez Lujan, who is the current director of the uh, of the Templo Mayor. Um, he wrote a book about um, uh, Templo Mayor with his dad, Alfredo Lopez Austin. Um, but he was saying that when they were doing all these excavations, you know, from Templo Mayor and other uh, areas, that the uh, the trash that they found was not of anything but like. 20th century trash so it wasn't like they kept they you know in a lot of the findings a lot of the discoveries they discover the tombs they discover the bodies they discover the artifacts that go with the bodies and the tombs but there was never anything that you would consider trash the only thing that they would find would be trash or products that were produced during the 20th century um, so that just goes to show you how clean they were, you know, and I think that that's really uh, just incredible to, to think about that, that we had a society that was so all about respecting nature, respecting our bodies with our cleanliness, uh, respecting the idea of, you know, the spirits of water, the spirits of everything else. Um, I don't know if anybody has any, any insight into that or has yeah. Yes, Sara. Well, to go off what you said, it like it's how 
the Mexica worked with the gods, how a lot of Mesoamericans worked with the gods as a collaborative and they worked with the earth as well as a collaborative because we, because the gods and the earth are intertwined. Each god brought them different things to the earth, which is, which is beautiful, which is why I think they cherished it so much. One of the things that I'll always, about colonization that'll make me so upset is I can't believe the Spaniards drained all the Chiampas. How do you compare something so beautiful as they compared it to Venice the moment they saw it and to just destroy it? Of course, that was, that's a whole other can to open, but yeah, um, right. I do see it as a, just a beautiful collaborative and I wish that type of idealism stayed. Um, I'm happy that people are starting to see it now, but it's definitely a long way to go. Right. Uh, it'd yeah, be well, amazing. It's... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's just amazing to think that way. And to me, when I think of decolonization, I think a part of it is working with the earth again. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, uh, what uh, Sara was saying in regards to the destruction of a lot of, the, of these forces was, you know, can be seen because literally the only place where you will see Chinampas now is in that tiny, tiny area of Xochimilco, you know, and you go on the Trajineras and you, you know, but it, it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, that, uh, that actual system um, tended to adapt in other places. I remember that in uh, this place that I grew up in, Santa Maria del Rio, because there was a river, what they would do is they wouldn't cut out the full chinampa, but they would just cut it into really deep into the uh, earth. And it was literally a well so that the river would drop off, you know, naturally drop off, you know, but it was a, it, it was an, uh, a different type of chinampa style farming, agriculture. And so, yeah, I mean, giving back, getting back to those ideas and finding those ways to re, re, bring back something, I think it's going to be a really great word for us to perhaps try to save earth, you know, I mean, that, that's a noble cause. Um, does anyone have any final, any final thoughts, anything you'd like to contribute? I'm looking at you, Marcos. <laughs> no, I, uh, first of all, thank you, Gabriela, for that beautiful presentation. Um, just really insightful and, and, and well informative. Um, and yeah, I think, I think uh, like you mentioned in your presentation that we can, we can adapt to, to, the, to the same systems that um, our ancestors or, or not my ancestors, but like, you know, that civilization created and somehow um, was very sustainable. Um, I think, um, now in this contemporary moment in, in, in Los Angeles and California, or but as, as, a, as a society, we can look back and, 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 and see, but also learn um, from them as well. Um, yes. Our rivers are, are being used. Um, we have an LA river and it's disgusting. You know, it's not used for anything. It's just like a, as a dumping drainage back to the ocean. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know how we're using these um, uh, natural, uh, um, I don't know what the word is, but yeah, like, we ha have to find a, a way to um, um, become uh, sustainable, um, but also uh, be very respectful of the environment. Um, right, right. Thank you. I don't know what the solution is, honestly, but I do feel like at the more we study the past, I think the, the, the answers will come for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's why, yeah, you couldn't have said it best. I think that's the whole point of, of why Gabby did this. And, you know, when I first, when I first heard this lecture a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't even get through half of the lecture. Um, I stopped Gabby and I was like, you, you, like, this is genius, you know, because <laughs> it really reminds us, like, look, we do have answers to our sustainability problems. We just have to get informed about it and, and look back and maybe, you know what, maybe I don't need to have the 20,000 pairs of shoes or, you know, buy the 
billion dollar home. I could live in a simple, you know, in a simple way that will help um, our earth reclaim its, 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 uh, its own nature, you know? Um, I think this is why we, we see that even in, in the way that we talked about um, what these uh, ancient people had for, for their own bodies, you know, the, the fact that you just had a petate and that was your bed and that was your table and that was your, you know, your coffin. That's, you know, I think that's a great way to, to look at it. So um, on behalf of the Art History Summer Series for 2020, I just want to say thank you for taking the time, for taking this opportunity to grow as, 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 uh, as historians, as artists, as people of interest. Um, you know, it takes a small pebble to make a huge ripple in this wonderful lake that we call knowledge. So thank you again. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this lecture. Uh, and uh, Gabby, thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and, and really doing something wonderful, which is to present, uh, you know, the, the work that you did. It is incredible. Um, you. You keep, you. We keep raising the bar. We keep raising the bar. So, uh, so um, I'm going to stop recording, but I'd still like to stay on for like another five minutes with everyone. Um, sure. So we can just kind of chat and, and, you know, dissect and debrief. We yeah. haven't said anything yet, but oh, I, I can you? Oh, yes, please, yes, Rosalind. I just want to say how much we enjoyed it, how much um, it makes me sad. Yes that we've lost that kind of knowledge and, and usability. Um, and I must say I'm pessimistic about uh, this civilization ever getting smart enough to get back to it. Um, but that, that would be lovely. It would just be lovely. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and you know what, let me, let me actually do this. Can I do a shout out for Rosalind? And, and uh, because uh, and Joe, Joe's here too, my husband and Joe, because they were here on like around six thirty-five. I mean, they even, I think they even beat me. So we just wanted to be sure we had the right connection. Next yeah. time, we'll, we, well, we'll know that it's it's easier. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much, and exactly, exactly, Ralph, and you know, thank you for for putting that out there because you know we as colleagues can can have all our opinions, but uh, the fact that somebody else can see that is is exactly why we do this. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Well, thank, thank Alegria for letting us know. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes.